Good morning to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Sunday, the 17th of September, 2017. Looking at the Western Atlantic satellite loop, here is Hurricane Jose, probably strengthening just a little bit. We will wait and see what the National Hurricane Center says, but it looks like it's developed some deeper convection right there near the center. And so it's probably getting a little bit stronger, and that will make the waves bigger. That will emanate out towards the coastline here. Uh, bringing high surf advisories. We're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. Then we have Maria just entering the frame down here. Luckily, for now, it's not rapidly intensifying. Uh, it kind of looks a little blotchy. We will take a closer inspection of that as well. So here's the close-up visible of Jose. And you can see this pretty good explosion of deep convection right here, especially expanding out to the northwest. And uh, fairly decent outflow. There's not a visible eye in satellite imagery just yet, and maybe there never will be, but uh, as long as that's not the case, it's not necessarily strengthening very quickly, but my guess is that this will eventually become a Category 2, and maybe even a Category 3 as it moves up, uh, generally uh, generally along or, or between 72 longitude and 73 degrees longitude here, and eventually either coming just shy of New England or maybe passing over southeast New England, they're still a few days away in terms of the track potential here and the errors and how the models are handling this. Uh, some of the models were a little bit more west last night and some were right on or maybe a little bit east. It's just kind of getting sandwiched in between high pressure areas and this little alleyway. The sides of the alleyway are constantly changing, put it that way. So you're trying to squeeze you know, this big bus down the alley, but the alley itself, the width of it, is constantly changing. That's one way to look at this. Now, as far as Maria goes, the uh, only good news we have this morning, I think, with this is that you can tell there's just probably a little bit of shear or something going on to where the edge of the central dense overcast is not quite reaching all the way over the low-level center. It's kind of like it has... Uh, a little bit of an exposed western center, but more than likely that's going to be temporary as all of the model guidance uh, suggests that this will become very strong as it heads off in this general direction over time. And so you folks over here in the northern leewards and the U.S. British Virgin Islands need to be getting ready. People need to be getting out. And we're going to look at this in more detail via one of the models in just a moment. So the track forecast here for Jose uh, moving to the north for the most part and then fading out to the northeast and then kind of drifting eastward. Uh, the UK met and the European model were a little bit more west with this over time and then they just kind of drop it out to the east like that. So that might bring it a little closer to the New Jersey coastline. Um, but I don't see any direct landfall impacts associated with this just yet. Not any indication that this just comes barreling into New England. I don't see that as an issue. And even if it were to do so, the water temperatures, once you get up into this region, are quite a lot cooler. You probably already knew that, but just a reminder that it will weaken, but it will also deflate and kind of spread out. And that wind field will expand, and we're going to see some pretty strong northeast winds up here, all the way down the coast to eventually northerly winds along the Outer Banks. And so there could be some coastal flooding issues, maybe a few scattered showers along the western periphery, of the circulation and then of course very high waves dangerous rip currents and you can't really see it too well on this particular graphic but all along here most of the coastal areas now of the east coast have a purple shading to them and if i just click down here into central florida you see that much closer here uh the high surf advisory so you know you just go to weather.gov look at the map Either put your zip code in or click on it, wherever you're interested in, and you can read about that high surf advisor, especially if you have plans to go to the beach. You want to keep yourself and the family nice and safe. In the offshore waters, there are different warnings that are up, but that's for the offshore area. For land areas, to my knowledge, we don't have any tropical storm watches or warnings in effect uh, for land specifically, but just in the coastal waters, like if we click on eastern North Carolina, just in the offshore waters, tropical storm watch, and then farther out to see there, tropical storm warning. Obviously, that is of interest to mariners 
And so just keep that in mind if you are traveling uh, in a boat, which, uh, you know, if you're in a small craft, you might want to just stay in port. All right, so the forecast from the Hurricane Center from the 5 a.m. advisory. This is the 8 a.m. intermediate advisory, but the track forecast doesn't change on that advisory. Generally speaking, a major hurricane, Category 3 or higher, headed right through the areas that Irma devastated not too long ago, and maybe even a direct hit on Puerto Rico, and possibly interaction with the Dominican Republic by next Friday. So we're going to be tracking this for several days. And then in terms of any impacts here to the southeast United States, it is obviously too soon to tell. You know the routine with that. You know, instead of going over all the different models and the scenarios, the overnight run of the European model basically brings this up and then runs it into North Carolina for the most part, not necessarily exactly like that. And then the GFS is pretty insistent on this getting and turning it out. And the Euro showed that yesterday afternoon. So there's a little bit of waffling going back and forth with the models, and it certainly suggests that folks here along the southeast coast, the Bahamas, need to watch Maria very closely once we get past the five-day time frame. I think within the next 48 hours, we're going to get a better handle on what's happening because I believe that it has every bit to do with what ends up being the end game for Jose. If Jose were to get caught in the westerlies and get whisked out to sea, then I think this ridge is going to build back over the top stronger, and it would more than likely drive Maria into the southeast somewhere. It's just hard to say where. On the other hand, if Jose comes up here and mills around, it kind of leaves a weakness up here, erodes the ridge a little bit by its very presence, and that could cause some interesting interactions with Maria. And the GFS is picking on that, picking up on that from time to time. But like I said last night, the European model, the ECMWF, clearly makes a landfall with Maria uh, in North Carolina. So we'll watch that. But you know what? <clears throat> you know, down the road, six, seven, eight days, we have plenty of time to prepare. Even folks in Florida, who are still reeling, of course, not even a week out now uh, yet from Irma, there's plenty of time to watch. I will say that for now, I don't see any indications that this just continues on to the west-northwest across the Keys or anything like that. Put a big X there. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm not seeing that in the guidance. I'm not seeing strong ridging building in over the top like this that would just drive Maria in south of that ridge and into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's that at least. So what I do want to focus on, though, is the impending danger perhaps, to the Lesser Antilles. So this is the H-Wharf, the Hurricane Weather Research Forecast Model. And this is from the 6Z run. And so this is one of the regional hurricane models. It is specifically designed for tropical cyclones. And this is the 24-hour plot. And if we go out here to 48 hours, you see it's starting to approach the islands. And let's point out what's what. Here's Guadalupe right here. Looks like a butterfly. And then you have Antigua. And then you have Barbuda. And I hope I've got all these right. And then up here, there's St. Bart's. Here's St. Martin. And here's Anguilla. And it escapes me as to what these are. And that's my fault. Uh, early in the morning, a lot of islands to keep up with. But you know your islands if you're in the area. And that's what's the most important thing. And we need to watch this. Now, this is one model, one run. There are different variations of the different models. I just want to show you the potential here. So that's 48. Now we're just going to go into 12-hour increments. And uh, you know what I'm going to do real quick, though, just to smooth this out, because I hate leaving loose ends. We're going to go to the Google Maps, and we're going to know the name of those islands. All right, so let's zoom out. And if it will cooperate... St. Kitts and Nevis are in there. I just want to make sure I get the right ones. So bear with me. You know, we just kind of do this live, right, even though I'm recording it. It's important because the impacts down there are going, that's what I thought, St. Kitts and Nevis. I just had a little brain freeze. Montserrat, of course, is to the northwest. So here we are at the 60-hour time frame. St. Kitts and Nevis here, and there's Montserrat. And then, of course, St. Bartolome. St. Martin, Anguilla. And this comes right through. There is 
Barbuda right there, I do believe, kind of buried in the wind field. And if we go on out to the next 12 hours, so this will be 72 hours out in time. As unbelievable as it would seem that nature would do this, you know, there's Anguilla right there, there's St. Martin, and then buried right in here in the western eye wall with the eye about to go over it would be St. Bartolome. And that's just horrible. But people need to be aware of this. There needs to be a huge concerted effort all across this region here to get people into some serious safe shelter. I, I don't know how easy it is to just get them out of there. Where are you going to take them? But they need some reinforcements because this could be a Category 3 as it moves through. Uh, this high-resolution version shows the pressure down to about 941 millibars and the winds, you know, probably 130, 135 miles per hour, something like that. Uh, we keep moving out into time. This is 84 hours, and you can see it approaching the uh, same areas that Irma impacted. And if we look at the maps here, we're talking the British Virgin Islands. And let me get rid of the telestration. Come on. There we go. And we can zoom in, and you get an idea, you know, as unbelievable as it sounds, there it is once again. It's at 84 hours approaching the British Virgin Islands. And then over to the west, there's Puerto Rico. And then at 96 hours, day four, after passing through the Virgin Islands, the U.S. and the British Virgin Islands with major impacts, uh, the h wharf model here keeps it just north of Puerto Rico. Now, other modeling brings it much closer. The GFS is right on top, down the middle of Puerto Rico, or just skirting um, the north coast of the Dominican Republic, but we're not talking about much difference here in the center position between the GFS and the H wharf model, considering we're basically looking at 60 to 72 to 96 and then finally 120 hours out in time. The bottom line is when you see something like this coming through an area that just got ravaged by a major historic hurricane, you definitely have to take notice and we have to make sure that these people are aware, no sugarcoating it, no hope for the best. It's time for action down there to save these lives that are so very vulnerable. All right, so I'm going to be on top of this. I've got this update now. I'll have another update in the late afternoon. And then I'm planning on going up to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina uh, just to observe things, maybe set up a camera right on the beach and show you some of those breaking waves. Since the conditions won't be too severe, we don't have to worry about the camera losing its network connection, like uh, what happened in Marathon and Marco Island in a category, probably a category four. Um, but that's a story for another day. This is an opportunity to place the camera in a spot that you simply just can't stand in to watch the waves. You know, and there's beach cams and surf cams, and those are great. But I want to immerse you and let you almost feel the energy because it has sound. And you'll be able to hear those waves breaking, and you can almost feel that bass coming through the microphone. It's quite something. So I'm going to go up to Kitty Hawk later today, be there through tomorrow, and I'll bring you some coverage from up there. All right? And like I said, I'm going to be doing these video discussions at least twice a day with the next one coming up later this afternoon. That's all I've got for now, though. I'm Mark Suttle for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks for tuning in on this Sunday morning. I'll talk with you again this afternoon.